since we know that charged particles push on other charged particles, we can start to talk about something called the electric field of a charged particle. And the field we can think of as an area of space around a charged particle. And when other charged particles are in that area of space around it, it may feel a force in a particular direction and with a particular amount of force. And the strength of that force, or what we call the field intensity, really is a vector quantity. And so when we draw the vector field, we draw it with arrows. And we also use the convention that the arrows will always go away from positive charges and towards negative charges. Or in other words, it'll look like our arrows are pointing, coming out of the positive charges and going into negative charges. So an example of what that might look like is if, for example, I draw a simple positive charge. Well, we can draw lots of lines coming off of it in all directions that represent its field lines. But it's not just that there are certain lines. Those are actual directions as well. They are vectors. So I'm just going to add arrows to them that point in a particular direction. And I'm going to follow the convention that I just mentioned, that all of our arrows should be pointing away from a positive charge. And what those arrows are representing is the direction that a positively charged particle would be pushed if it was placed in the field around that first positively charged particle. But what about if the thing that I was starting with wasn't a positive charge? What about if it was a negative charge? So I can draw a little negatively charged particle. Again, I'll draw very similar lines all around it. But now its arrows are going to point towards the charge. So again, in other words, these arrows are really representing the direction that some positively charged particle would be pushed if it was placed in the field near that first charged particle. So if I put a little positive particle, I take a little positive charge and I put it in space somewhere over here, it's going to be pushed in towards that negatively charged particle. If I put a little positively charged particle in this area of space, near the other positive charge, it's going to be pushed away. And so those field lines are really just representing what direction would the particles be pushed in. Specifically, what direction would a positive particle be pushed in? It's also useful to see what it would look like when we put them together. So if I have a positively charged particle and a negative one fairly close to one another, we actually see their fields interact. So I would have some lines that go straight away from the positive charges. I would have some lines that would go straight in towards the negative charges. I would have some that go away from the positive and go towards the negative, so I can connect that one on a straight line. And then the others would end up wrapping around. And so we would end up with some curved lines. And some of them would actually wrap all the way around and connect. So we've got particles, again, if we were to put any positively charged particle anywhere in that diagram, the lines would give us some idea of where they would be pushed. So for example, if I put a little charged particle with a positive charge here, well, it's going to be feeling a combination of forces. It's going to be pushed a little bit away from the positive charge, but also a little bit towards the negative charge. And the combination of those two things that it's feeling are what's going to make its field line curved in that area. It's going to feel a force that's essentially pushing it away from the positive and towards the negative at the same time. If we want to represent a field being much stronger, what we do is we just draw more of these field lines. We put more vectors into our diagram. So, for example, if I just have a positively charged thing, and I'll, I won't really say exactly how much charge it has, but I'm just going to say that it has positive one charge. And I'm then going to compare that a little later with something that has double that, which what I'll call positive two Q. 
and the Q is just some amount of charge. So all I'm really saying is that the first diagram will be just one amount of charge, the second one will be double that. For the first one, I can draw some field lines to represent it, very similar to what I did before. And if it's a positive charge, all the arrows should be going away. Then with something that has double the amount of charge, it will produce double the amount of strength in its field. And so I'm going to draw twice as many field lines to represent it. So I'll maybe start in a similar way. And now instead of just eight field lines, I now have 16 field lines that I've drawn all the way around. And so twice the strength of the field means that I have twice as many field lines that I need to draw. One last important thing to remember is that these field lines should never cross one another. And so they may curve in certain ways, like we saw in part one, but they will never actually cross. So for example, if I was to just draw a positively charged particle and a negatively charged particle, well, we know that there will be a field line that will go straight from one to the other, away from the positive and towards the negative, but we wouldn't see some random field line that went down and then up and through, something like that. We would never see that kind of line. Because what that would mean is there would be a specific point where the field lines cross, and if you were a particle sitting right at that point where they cross, you'd actually be feeling two completely different forces coming from the same charged particle. And that really doesn't make sense. Each charged particle will only push in one particular direction. But we won't feel two separate forces all coming from one charged particle at a time. And so that's why we say that these field lines should never cross when we use these field line diagrams in order to represent the field. So what we need to do then is, in a diagram like this, circle it put a big cross through it and remind yourself that that will never happen. We should never have the field lines crossing at any point. And in this course we won't be doing a lot of calculations of the actual amount of force that a charged particle would feel. In fact, we won't really do any calculations of electric force. You'll do that more so in grade 12. But I just want to present the formula to you so that you can take a look at what it's telling us. And it's something called Coulomb's Law. It says that the electric force, which we can measure in newtons, is based on a few things. Well, it's based on Q1 and Q2. So Q is what we're using to represent an amount of charge. And each charged particle that's interacting has some amount of charge. And so Q1 is just the charge of the first object, and Q2 is the charge of the second object. We use R to represent the distance that they're separated. And then we just use this one extra thing called K, which was Coulomb's constant, that helps us to connect the units up correctly. Now, if you're looking at that and thinking that it looks a little bit familiar, it's because it is. It's actually very similar to the universal gravitation equation. So not the simple one that Fg equals mg, but the one that we could use for the gravity between any objects. Big G times m1 times m2 divided by r squared. So you can see there's a lot of similarities there, only instead of using m1 and m2, so instead of being dependent on the two masses, it's dependent on q1 and q2, the two charges. But there's one other big difference and it's a really crucial difference. We use the letter G instead of the letter K. And it's not just a different letter, it's a very different value. So G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Whereas K is 9.0 times 10 to the 9. So one is an incredibly tiny number, and the other is a huge number. Essentially what we're seeing here is that k is about 
10 to the power of 20 times larger. And 10 to the power of 20 is a really huge number. That's like a 1 with 20 zeros attached to it. That's how many times larger that constant value is. And so you can imagine overall, that's going to mean that the force that we calculate when we do electric force is going to be a much greater value than the typical things we get when we calculate gravitational force. And that's why even if we've got just very small amounts of charge, we still see some force being exerted. It's easy to see those effects. Whereas if we have very small amounts of mass, we don't see very much gravity at all. And it all relates to that extra constant value that's in that equation. It makes them very different from one another, even though they are set up in a very similar way. We can also do calculations about how much charge something has. Because typically we don't just see one single individual charged particle all on its own. What we see are groupings of atoms and molecules that end up with some overall charge. And so what we measure charge in is something called coulombs. And coulombs are just what we can think of as like a bucket of charge. Think of it as a whole bunch of charged particles all together. And eventually, in the early 1900s, Robert Millikan did a very famous experiment that you'll talk more about in grade 12, where he was eventually able to figure out what the charge of just one single electron was. And when he isolated that, he realized that it was about 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So it has an incredibly small amount of charge when we measure it in coulombs. What that's telling us is that one coulomb, one of these big buckets of charge, is the same amount of charge as you would have if you took 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons. So. That's another way of saying if you took a little over 6 million trillion electrons, put them all together in a big bucket, they would have the charge that we would call one coulomb. We can then use that in order to solve some related problems. So if we know the charge on something and we know the charge of just one single electron, we could use that to figure out how many extra or missing electrons it has, what we call excess or deficit. Because remember, particles become charged because they've either lost some electrons or they've gained some electrons. And we can figure out exactly how many they've lost or gained. So let's do that for example one. So if we know a balloon has a charge of negative 1.2816 times 10 to the negative 18, we want to know how many excess electrons it has based on that number of coulombs. The reason why the number of coulombs is negative is because it must have extra electrons. That's why we know to ask the question, how many excess electrons does it have? In other words, how many extra electrons does it have? Whereas if this thing had lost some electrons, it would be some positive number of coulombs. Well, if we just write down what we know, we're told the charge of the balloon. So that's Q. Q is negative 1.2816 times 10 to the negative 18, and that's in coulombs. We also know that the charge of one single electron was also a negative value because electrons have what we call a negative charge. 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And we are just looking for N which is just the number of electrons that we have, or in this case, the number of extra electrons that we have. So we can use a very simple formula that says that our charge in total is just the number of extra electrons that we have multiplied by the charge of each electron. So that value E is the just charge of each electron that we have. In our case, though, we want to rearrange this. We want to find n, so we're going to use this equation in a different way. We're going to take q and divide by the charge of just one electron. So when I do that, I take negative 1.2816 times 10 to the negative 18 coulombs. I divide by negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. 
What happens with the units is that they actually completely cancel out. I'm taking something in coulombs and dividing by something in coulombs, which means the answer that I get will be unitless, which is okay. It'll mean it's just a number, some number of electrons. And when we do that and we divide it out, you'll get eight. So in other words, we could create a therefore statement after that says, therefore, the balloon must have eight extra electrons. And that's why it has that small amount of charge on it. I'll let you take some time and try example two, and I'll circle back around to these things in class and talk a bit more about how these field lines work and take up example two altogether.